Welcome to the We Value Nature 10 Days Challenge. I'm Giulia Carbone from the Business and Biodiversity Program. And we are here today for a special event launching the IUCN guidelines for planning and monitoring corporate biodiversity performance. But before we dive into that, I just have a couple slides I wanted to share with you that will give you a little bit of a context about the 10 days challenge, first of all. Um, you are, as you know, this is like a 10 days event that started 11th of March and will and finish the 24th of March. There are a number of events uh, that were still gonna happen in the next few days. So please register for that, but also register for the uh, daily challenge, which is uh, apparently a very fun activity that you can take every day. Uh, this is the, num the partners that have contributed to this uh, uh, program. And this is today's event. This is uh, about planning and monitoring corporate biodiversity performance. Uh, before I dive into the content, I'd like to invite uh, Gillian Martin Meheres, who is our technical support today, to give us some, uh, some guidance on how to use the Zoom webinar uh, platform today. Gillian, over to you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Julia. So we will be using two functions for this webinar, the Q&A function and the chat. The Q&A function is going to be used for asking and answering questions. So it's important that for any questions you have, you use the Q&A function. The chat, however, we'll be using to share some information on our speakers and also for discussion amongst participants. Please note that we won't be taking any of the questions from the chat. So if you have questions, you need to use the Q&A function. Julia, if you can go to the next slide. So how to ask questions. So Zoom webinar has a particular Q&A function um, and we've enabled the ability for you to see all of the questions that the participants are asking. So you need to click on the Q&A icon, which you find at the bottom of your screen, most screens anyways. That opens a window where you can type in your question. You can see and upvote other questions by clicking on the thumbs up that shows up under the question. So if you do that, and then many people are very interested in one particular question or a number of questions, then when we get to the live session, we'll be able to see where your interest lies. We also have enabled the function allowing you to answer or comment on other people's questions too. So if you're so inclined, you're more than welcome to provide some additional information or answer the questions. So the two things about answering questions, we're going to pick some of the questions to answer live in the session. And we have one live Q&A time. During that time, it's after our first three speakers, um, Julia will be selecting some of the live questions and they will be, the speakers will answer those. After that, PJ, one of our speakers is going to be answering as many questions as he possibly can in writing in the time available. So those answers you'll be able to see again under the Q&A function. If by the end of this session, your question hasn't been answered, then please write to biobiz at iucn.org after the session, and we will answer your question by email. So that's how to ask questions. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much. So I have now the honor to go into the presenting what is going to be the program for today. The, the organization is basically the two hours are organized around two main blocks. The first one is a presentation of the guidelines by the authors, myself, PJ Stevenson. And then we're going to have also Katie Leach from WCMC presenting the links between the guidelines and other processes. That's basically session two in the agenda. Uh, the second hour is really going to be focused on the experience in implementing in using these guidelines. And these are experiences from Nespresso, Boscalis, and Alcoa. So we are going to present our guest speakers uh, in the second hour. And that will be a mix between questions in a kind of a panel type of approach and then uh, real technical presentations. And then our conclusions where we are gonna discuss also what is gonna be next steps for IUCN in using these guidelines. So without further ado, I'll start presenting. And it's my role to actually open this session and really uh, launch the guidelines. These are the, this is where you can download them uh, hopefully they're available. They were embargoed until 4 p.m. And uh, it's, uh, it's the result of a long process. 
uh, and it's really started a uh, few years ago when we start co the conversations about the use of indicators. Everything really started from there and understanding how businesses use the indicators, the different applications for indicators and the realization that there were already, there are already a lot of systems, but we felt there was a gap in, in, uh, in specifically finding a system that will allow at the corporate level of creating a system that would help create a unified picture of biodiversity performance at the corporate level. Really something that would bring together different activity size products, brands, and give the possibility of, to companies at the corporate level to create some KPIs. So this was really the backdrop uh, for our search for, uh, you know, for the development of the guidelines. We have started to think about you know, different um, different ways of doing this. And we came up with, there are basically four key um, uh, elements that we have, we have used to structure the guidelines. First of all, is the fact that they are, they are organized around result-based management, which means that we are not starting to talk about indicators, but the first thing we, we talk about is what is the footprint, what, where you want to be based on this footprint. So this is the discussion about goals, objectives, and then we talk about indicators. And, and this is really also very much how conservation organizations develop their own uh, interventions. So that's why we also start working with uh, our Species Survival Commission monitoring specialist group, because this is really how they frame, we frame conservation interventions. We also agreed that we were not gonna be able to uh, develop off the shelf metrics, but we was really about defining metrics that are fit for purpose and indicators that are fit for purpose, depending on what is the biodiversity questions. And again, these biodiversity questions is how you define your objectives. And very importantly, we, we want to make sure that what we are doing is not replacing, but is complementing site level action plans, which could be, you know, often called biodiversity action plans, but the work that we are launching today is not a replacement to site level activities being action plans and monitoring plans. And the other element that we really try to stress throughout the guidelines is the link with other processes, especially with GRI and the science-based targets, but many other tools in that we will present. Um, so in terms of target audience, who could use this guideline? We say everybody, any company can, can use these guidelines in the primary sector, secondary or tertiary. So from raw materials, manufacturing and services. However, what is a, a must is to have some data about what happens on the ground. That's otherwise will be very difficult to put in place, especially, I mean, the first stage, which is the fundamental stage for the entire process which is about understanding the impacts and dependency. So some information is necessary about that. Now, of course, there is a journey. Every company is in a journey. There is a very much a possibility that some companies will start with a small amount of information and they can, and can, they can build this system based on a small amount and then aim at enlarging the scope of the data they have. Um, but some data is absolutely fundamental. So as I said, this, the guidelines are structured around three main elements. As I already mentioned, result-based management. A second one is the scalable goals and indicators. This idea that some indicators and goals can be measured at the site level, but then can be aggregated up to the corporate. And these are the ones that we will you know, suggest to uh, track and aggregate so that you can basically have an overview of what is happening across the different sites and operations at the corporate level. And another very important element is the pressure state response benefit uh, framework, which includes basically calls for indicators that are linked, indicators that measure pressure, that are linked to indicators that measure state, that are linked to indicators that measure response and benefits. And PJ will go in much more detail about this, but the, the beauty of the system that we are proposing is that um, having indicators in these four categories allows also for flexibility of having some answers very quickly because some indicators are more, you know, more uh, fast in, in generating data, while other, for other indicators, it will take longer time. So just as a sneak preview of how, you know, the guidelines are structured, we are talking about four stages 
from the assessment, from the, um, sorry, ah, sorry, um, indicators and implementation. And uh, PJ will go in much more detail about each stage. And these are basically recommendations on how to implement each stage. That's what you will find in the guidelines. But another thing we'll find in the guidelines is basically a toolkit. Because for each of these stage, we have provided a very detailed annex with links to many different tools that can be used to implement that stage. So for example, this is an, an example, a screenshot for um, stage one, which is really looking at the assessment of impacts and, uh, and um, dependencies. And you can see already some of these tools are very familiar to most of you. And this is how basically suggestions on how to use these tools to get to that final stage, basically, which is identifying your pressures and dependencies. And also the guidelines has really, we have really carefully thought about how we align, how, how these guidelines are aligned with the many processes out there, because we realize that there is a lot happening, which is absolutely excellent. And it's something that we really should nourish in making sure that we are as much as possible aligned. So we have um, identified a number of uh, processes and tried to see, you know, to demonstrate how we fit, how these guidelines fit into the other processes. And but also this is also why we have invited Katie Leach, who will present for WCMC, who will present on some of these and, and explain in more details how we fit in that. So um, I think that's it for my side. I like now to invite PJ to go in more detail and present the guidelines. Thank you, PJ. Let me stop. Thank you, Julia. And thank you uh, to all the participants for joining us today for the launch uh, of our guidelines. Um, I cannot, uh, in the time available now, uh, obviously take you through all of the details uh, we've put in the guidelines, but what I will do is explain to you in a little bit more detail than Julia did uh, the different stages and some of the key steps within those stages, to at least give you a flavour uh, of what's involved, and then you can obviously dig deeper into these yourselves afterwards. So I think at the outset, I'd just like to say that as we developed these guidelines, we kept in mind the fact that we're well aware many companies still find biodiversity very daunting. I mean, if you think about it, the sheer diversity of life on Earth, bacteria to blue whales and everything in between, that's incredibly complex. And it's very challenging for companies to understand how to assess biodiversity, how to plan for their interactions with biodiversity and how to monitor their performance. So what we've basically done with the guidelines is go back to basics. We've taken the lessons learned from decades of conservation science and conservation practice, and then translated those into the business context. And so I think if I was to put it really simply, what the guidelines do for companies is they help them identify threats and pressures on biodiversity that are relevant to the company, they help the company decide what it's to do to address those threats and pressures. They define, or they help companies define exactly what success with biodiversity would look like. And then they help companies identify key performance indicators that can help them monitor performance and impact and progress on delivery. So as Julia said, the stages in the guidelines basically help a company develop a strategic plan for biodiversity. And the first stage is about priorities. So this is about understanding the company's impact on biodiversity and identifying priority species, habitats, and ecosystem services. And so what this stage does is provide companies not only with prioritized list of pressures that they need to tackle, but it also produces a list of priority species, priority habitats, and priority ecosystem services the company should focus on. So what this stage basically does is unpack biodiversity for the company and make the company understand what biodiversity means in its own context. So the first step 
uh, in this stage is about defining the corporate scope of biodiversity influence. This is a concept similar to the one used in other standards and guidelines, so it will be familiar uh, to some companies already, and many companies will also have the information they need from EIAs and other assessments. Now, what we're asking companies to do here is basically see where do their operations and supply chains actually interact with nature. So this will obviously vary greatly depending on the company, its complexity. Um, but as an example, a mining company might want to consider here its mining activities, as well as its refining, smelting and or transport activities. A food manufacturing company might need to look at the production or the farming of raw materials, the transformation of those raw materials, the manufacturing of finished products, and then the packaging and the transport to points of sale. So all these are examples of what should be included in the corporate scope of biodiversity influence. The next steps uh, in this stage are all about helping the company identify the pressures and dependencies associated uh, with their operations and supply chains. Now, as we do throughout the guidelines, we provide a number of hypothetical examples. You will notice that some of them are based in the sectors of the companies we worked with, but a lot of the examples themselves are literally hypothetical and to give you an idea of uh, the sorts of things that companies will get out of the, applying the guidelines. So here, for example, we've got an example for a mining company. Its activities might then lead to land use change and pollution. And what we do in the guidelines then is take companies through steps to help them score the relative importance of the pressures on biodiversity from their operations. We come up with a system to help score scope and severity of the pressures, and also to evaluate the degree of control the company has with those pressures. And that then allows the company to come up with a score and allows a prioritization. Why is prioritization important? Well, clearly a company can't at the corporate level look at every single small pressure it exerts on biodiversity. Some of the pressures, as Julia mentioned, will still be dealt with by site level biodiversity action plans. In the corporate level plans, what we're looking for is the higher priority pressures. And so high priority and moderate priority pressures, we then encourage companies to use as the basis for their objectives. The last step in this stage is about identifying priority biodiversity. Now, our thinking is that goals and objectives that are aimed broadly at undefined biodiversity will be impossible to implement or measure. But if goals and objectives identify specific species, habitats, and ecosystem services, then they can provide a focus for company strategies and indicators for monitoring. So the point I would flag here is this step of looking in detail at biodiversity is key for setting measurable goals and objectives. The choice of the biodiversity priorities should obviously be based on the biodiversity affected by the high and moderate priority pressures and also on the biodiversity upon which the company's activities are dependent. You also need to keep in mind at this stage, again, like the pressures, this is not about identifying all of the biodiversity affected by the company, but the most commonly affected species or those most impacted by operations. And again, some examples here. This is an example for a large uh, multinational company operating globally in the agricultural sector. And for companies like that with multiple supply chains, the level of detail about priority biodiversity will be broader. So in terms of taxa, they might rest at say forest birds or freshwater fish. Habitats might be broad, such as just wetlands. Um, we also encourage companies like several other uh, standards do to identify areas important for biodiversity. So any protected and conserved areas or key biodiversity areas close to operations uh, that could also be a focus. And then we also look at ecosystem services as well. Many of the priority ecosystem services will be derived directly from habitats um, and species that are identified as priority. And many will also uh, be in protected areas. So water and watersheds, for example, water quality, if that's an ecosystem service uh, you are trying to focus on, 
then that will be related to the forest habitats that are being uh, a focus of uh, priority biodiversity. However, smaller companies, companies operating in a smaller scale or, or the national branches of multinational companies can get more specific. And here we're really encouraging companies wherever possible to go down to the level of species. Can you actually name the bird species that might benefit from your operations? Can you be more specific about habitat types? And of course, if you know more where you're operating, you can also name some of the protected and conserved areas perhaps as well. Okay, so stage two, now we've established the priorities. This is about establishing ambitions. The first step here is about developing a vision. And we encourage companies to put in place a clearly articulated results oriented picture of the future the company intends to create built around the priorities identified in stage one. Now, again here, depending on the size of the company, some companies might find it more useful to focus the planning and monitoring around specific units. Um, so a large company with multiple products and supply chains may wish to plan and monitor around specific elements of its operations. So here it might aggregate um, its biodiversity work around product lines or raw materials or clusters of suppliers, types of operations and so forth. The choice here depends on factors such as which units are most dependent on biodiversity or are responsible for the most important biodiversity pressures. We're now ready to define goals and objectives and the guidelines have more explanation here. I would just highlight at this point that setting goals and objectives should be based on the priority species and pressures we've identified already. It should also build on existing company work and sustainability ambitions and where relevant includes contributions to any global goals like sustainable development goals the company wants to contribute towards. And it should also follow best management practices in goal and objective setting. So these should be measurable, achievable within a specific time period and relevant to the priorities and ambitions. What we also encourage companies is to do at this stage is to identify key strategies that are common across the company to deliver objectives. And again, these will vary, um, but they might include adopting no-go policies for protected areas or setting aside land for biodiversity, it could involve minimizing bycatch, restoring habitat, or measures to reduce pollution. Now, again, we're not trying to get the company to aggregate here and talk about everything it's doing, but we're looking at about the most common strategies. And one of the reasons for doing this is by identifying common strategies, it will also help us later identify relevant response indicators and measure performance. So now stage three is all about developing an indicator framework. And we propose, uh, as Julia said, uh, a framework of linked scalable indicators. And we in particular follow the pressure state response benefit model, largely because that's the model followed by a lot of conservation agencies. It's all also used by the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it's also used by the United Nations to track sustainable development goals. So how do these work? Uh, how do you choose these and how do they work in practice? Well, steps. The first two steps uh, of this stage, uh, we provide guidance on setting indicators. We provide a menu of options. And also, as Julia pointed out, in the annexes, uh, we have a series of guidelines and tools uh, to help people as well. And in the section, the annex on indicators, we provide uh, links to other guidance on setting indicators on other indicator sets and on data sets that might be useful for companies. So how does that, this then uh, operate in practice? Well, let's see how the linked indicator set works. This example is for a marine company that maybe has a goal related to fisheries uh, around a, a, an objective on reducing pollution. Well, let's say that the company's main response would be here to implement fleet management systems that reduce pollution. So here you might manage, measure this response by say, the number of staff trained and implementing the training. And what you would hope then would that would lead to a reduction in pollution from oil spills, which you can measure from the number and volume of spills. In turn, what you would hope from a reduction in spills would be an increase in water quality and ultimately an improvement in fish populations. And you would measure that with uh, indicators around perhaps water quality and fish species abundance. 
then ultimately the improvement in the ecosystem will hopefully lead to an improvement in e ecosystem services. And in this case, that would be the fishery. So we would hope the benefit would be the increase in fisheries, which would, could be monitored perhaps by an indicator around the volume of fish landed. Now, the whole point of this linked indicator set is to allow a company to track and monitor actions around its theory of change, what it's expecting to see happen. But also to close the loop, what ultimately we're seeing from conservation science is that where benefits are then measured and demonstrated, it actually encourages people to scale up and participate in the responses being used as well. Of course, what I'd like to highlight here is this sort of overview is only possible because we've gone through the other steps. We've identified the priority pressures and biodiversity and developed measurable goals, objectives and strategies. Okay, now we're into the final stage, which is implementation. This is about collecting, sharing and analyzing data, learning lessons and applying adaptive management. And essentially what we encourage companies to do here is to finish a monitoring plan. So you should by now have the indicators, but this is now about developing the rest of the monitoring plan. The how, the methods used, when the indicators uh, will be uh, used, when the data will be collected, who will collect the data and where the data will be collected. What we also then encourage companies to do is to share data both internally within the company but also externally as much as possible. And so we encourage them to put data into formats that facilitate data interpretation and use. And what we found in the conservation community uh, is that maps and dashboards are very good for this. This is an example from a conservation NGO showing pressure state and response indicators in a dashboard. And what we find is that graphs and colored charts help people quickly identify trends or outliers that they can then act on quickly. And that then takes us to the last part of this stage where we encourage companies to follow best management practices to conduct periodic evaluations and assessments, to then use those to learn and improve. So where you find that strategies are working well, then you can um, improve them, uh, scale them up um, and uh, replicate them. And of course, where strategies are working less well, then you might want to think again about whether they're the right ones to use. So it's about adapting based on what you're learning. And that then basically finishes the cycle. And as you can see, it is literally a, a complete cycle because when you've um, looked at your lessons learned, that is the time when most companies will occasionally, perhaps every few years, want to review their biodiversity priorities and ambitions based on lessons learned and maybe tweak them once in a while as necessary. I just finish by pointing out that the guidelines um, also discuss the enabling conditions necessary for companies to apply, to apply them. One of the key enabling conditions is the consultation with key stakeholders. So this is not just about talking to shareholders, but also talking about other people also uh, who have a relationship with the biodiversity uh, that is a priority for the company. So it's about government agencies, local communities and civil society and engaging those, especially from the goal setting stage onwards. We also talk about how companies will need to build company capacity and governance systems for mainstreaming biodiversity data into their corporate decision making. And also most companies will want to consider developing partnerships with academic institutions, NGOs and so forth to help them with some of this work. So there you go. That was literally a whistle stop tour of the IUCN guidelines. Um, this has been a long journey. Um, it's taken us something like four years since we started looking uh, at how we might go about this. It's involved lots of design discussions. It's involved development, testing. It's involved public consultations and a formal peer review process. The final product is still based on hard conservation science. But I think as you'll hear from our partner companies a bit later on, we're confident that they the guidelines can be applied and used for successfully for companies in different sectors. This doesn't take away from my earlier comment that biodiversity remains a complex issue and it will take most companies a bit of extra effort to be able to implement these guidelines um, and implement a strategic plan. But 
given the perilous state of the planet we all depend on, I don't think it's too much to expect for everybody to make a bit more effort to reduce humanity's impact on biodiversity. And we are confident that the IUCN guidelines will help provide companies with the tool they need to rise to the challenge. So thank you very much. Thank you, PJ. Thank you very much. And um, so before we go into the questions, I'd like to introduce now um, Katie Leach. Let me start my video. And Katie will give us an overview of what are the links between these guidelines and other processes. Over to you, Katie. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, and uh, great to be with you all today. I just want to start by congratulating IUCN on the guidelines and, and thanking Julia for inviting me to speak today. Um, we thought it would be really useful to talk through how the guidelines fit into this uh, this area of work, which is, is expanding dramatically. Um, there's lots of different guidance being released and, and we thought it might be useful to show how the IUCN guidelines fit as part of that. So in, in the guidelines themselves, which you all um, have, have access to now through, through the link that Julia shared, there's a table within the guidelines which explains how uh, it fits with other standards, guidelines and tools, how they complement the guidelines and how they fit within the landscape. So the guidelines address a particular need to develop a corporate level biodiversity strategic plan with goals, objectives and indicators in order to manage and monitor biodiversity impacts and dependencies associated with a company's operations. The guidelines take into account all of these other initiatives and highlight where each of them might be relevant to a given stage. There's also uh, annexes uh, that accompany the guidelines that provide a detailed list of all of the different standards, guidance, uh, documents and tools that might help a company uh, to implement stages one to four. So the IUCN guidelines fit for, for this specific need, but of course, there's other guidance documents, other measurement approaches, um, and other initiative standards and ratings that are available for companies to look at particular corporate level management needs. So there's three uh, initiatives in particular that I wanted to, to highlight here. Um, and I'm gonna talk through over the next few stages, to, uh, over the next few slides to show you about the complementarity with the guidelines. So. Um, I'm firstly going to talk about the, the links through the, with the science-based targets for nature and the guidance, the initial guidance that was launched by the Science-Based Targets Network in September last year. So the initial guidance um, shows five steps uh, for a process for setting science-based targets for nature. Firstly, starting in this assess stage to look at what is material and, and mapping your vi value chain moving to prioritizing those within a company's sphere of influence and sphere of control to prioritizing places uh, to then take forward for, for target setting. So step three of the initial guidance is where this all takes shape, where you're starting to uh, measure your baseline, develop monitoring plans and start to set these targets. Um, and uh, what's new from, from the Science-Based Targets Network is this step four act stage which provides a hierarchy for actions that you could take, very similar to mitigation hierarchy uh, that many people will be familiar with. So it's around avoiding, reducing, restoring and regenerating and transforming business models. And then the fifth step is about uh, tracking progress, so monitoring, reporting and, and verification. So the initial guidance is, is where we are now, but the Science Based Targets Network are working on full guidance, which will be launched. And that is all about looking at alignment uh, with, with global goals. So science based targets are about avoiding and reducing pressures, as well as contributing positively through investment in restoration, regenerative practices, conservation and transformative action. So increasing positive impact as well. And they define science-based targets as measurable, actionable, and time-bound objectives based on the best available science that allows actors to align with Earth's limits and societal sustainability goals. And this is the piece that is in development and it really uh, sets aside the science-based targets uh, guidance. So in terms of complementarity, uh, the guidelines, the IUCN guidelines, generally track with the initial guidance at, at a high level 
Um, but the science-based targets network recognizes that their technical team is still working, especially on uh, this, uh, this part around aligning with Earth's limits and what the thresholds for that are. So there may be changes as the science-based targets work continues that the technical teams will, will continue to look at the details and see how they match with, with the guidelines. The IUCN guidelines provide a, a way for businesses to get started now on developing their vision for corporate biodiversity goals, uh, their vision goals and objectives based on their own company assessment. The full science-based targets guidance uh, will place this in the context of global goals and planetary boundaries and look at how much is enough in terms of target setting and action. And with a bit of a deep dive, um, stage one of the guidelines that, that PJs has talked through is closely linked to step one of the initial guidance. However, the guidelines look at materiality from a business perspective, whereas the initial guidance takes a societal materiality lens and then refines this by company materiality in step 1c of this initial guidance. Stage two of the IUCN guidelines is, is very much linked to target and action setting that you might conduct under steps three and four of the initial guidance. And stages three and four of the guidelines provide a good basis to contributing to step five of the initial guidance where you're tracking progress uh, using uh, different indicators. So um, despite the different steps and stages in, in these two pieces, they are highly interrelated and both will lead companies to being ready for, for setting targets. And complementary to this um, is the, also the natural capital protocol, which many people will also be familiar with. Um, and also alongside that, the biodiversity guidance. So science by targets can help with uh, the targets, so the what, whereas the protocol and the biodiversity guidance helps with measuring and tracking how. So the natural capital protocol itself was launched in 2016 and then the supplementary biodiversity guidance was launched uh, just at the end of last year. And the guidance provides additional insights um, in conducting a biodiversity inclusive natural capital assessment um, with specific guidance for each of the stages. So, uh, guidance for the framing stage, the scoping stage, the measuring and valuing stage, and then the apply stage of the natural capital protocol. Um, and the biodiversity guidance is also seen to be accompanied by a navigation tool to, to navigate the way through these different guidances and, and tools that are available. And that will be launched as part of the We Value Nature 10 day challenge as well on Wednesday this week. So the guidelines from IUCN complement this uh, biodiversity guidance in, in a number of ways. So that in terms of the scoping guidance, uh, the guidelines provide further details on the scope of biodiversity impacts and dependencies and how to identify what is most important or material and how to identify the vision, goals and objectives. The guidelines also complement in terms of the measure and value stage. It shows how to develop a framework of linked core indicators for aggregating to corporate level. And then in terms of the apply stage, um, the guidelines explain how to develop and implement a monitoring plan and collect data uh, and do these periodic assessments. And as part of this, I then wanted to, to go on to my final piece, which is about measurement. Um, and the measuring guidance from the biodiversity guidance is heavily draws upon work from the Aligning Biodiversity Measures for Business Collaboration and work by many others in this space like the EU Business and Biodiversity Platform. So there's a huge amount of work ongoing in this space. Many of you will be aware of the existing and emerging measurement approaches for looking at biodiversity impacts and dependencies, many of which are noted also in the IUCN guidelines. There is a huge uh, body of work conducted by the EU Business and Biodiversity Platform every year to look at these different measurement approaches and, and what business applications they can support through this matrix and what organizational focus areas they look at. And there's a huge body of work to look at this and the case studies that are coming out of uh, testing those measurement approaches by businesses and financial institutions. And there's also an ongoing piece of work further to the Aligning Biodiversity Measures for Business collaboration, looking at aligning accounting approaches for nature, which was just launched last week and which is uh, hoping to move towards harmonization in biodiversity measurement. 
But within this, there are obviously a number of biodiversity footprinting approaches that are referenced in the IUCN guidelines, as well as a number of site-based approaches. For example, the biodiversity indicators for site-based impact method that takes a similar approach to the IUCN guidelines, looking at state pressure and response indicators at the site level. And many of these, as I said, are noted throughout the IUCN guidelines and, and show you how you can use them for different purposes. So here I've just tried to pick out some of those really key initiatives that the guidelines link to. Obviously, I can't cover all of them today, um, but happy to, to answer any questions when we get to the Q&A. And I think for now, I'll just uh, wrap up and, and thank you all and congratulate IUCN again on, on the launch of the guidelines. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, let me just stop sharing. Okay. Thank you. Um, PJ, yes, you're back on the video. Uh, I have now the task, multitask, which is not always easy, to find, um, first of all, just to remind everybody that the event is recorded and uh, both the, the recording and the slides will be made available on the We Value Nature platform. We will send later today an email to all the registered participants with the links on where you're going to find the recording and the slides you already have the, the detail of the, of the present, uh, sorry, of the document, but we will send also the rest later on. Um, so you have a chance later on to look into the detail of the slides, especially because some of these slides were very, very um, rich. So now some questions have, uh, we have around 20 questions. As I said, we are not gonna be able to answer all of them in the, in the Q and A uh, session that we have right now around 15 minutes those we can't answer. PJ will try to take them also not I mean, if, as many as you can in writing. And then if you are still want to an answer for those who have not received an answer, you can write to us later. So I'll start from the top. Um, I have a few questions here. So from TBC uh, that it says experience in, look, oh, that's changed already. Um, experience in the palm sector showed that hyper-prioritization meant that a lot of companies focus on the same upstream companies and on location, and there was a lot of overlapping effort. Ultimately, a shared strategy to address all the areas needed, how can company collaborate to systematically address all impacts in areas don't slip through, through because they don't meet high priority thresholds. Now, in addition to this one, there is another similar from our colleague from Jeff Sec that says, most if not all leading companies work as part of coalitions, sometimes commodity-based, cocoa, soy, or on shared resources, reliance on water and share catchment, marine fisheries. This looks great at the company level as explained, and I could also envisage how this model could be followed by coalitions or logical clusters of companies in a region. Do we have examples of such collaboration or is this a goal? So maybe PJ, you know, these two questions are dif different, but I think they lead to similar, you know, conversations. And maybe also based on the experience we had in, um, in Brazil with the, you know, the Cerrado de dos Aguas, you can give us a little bit of an idea of how to prioritize, how to avoid hyper prioritization and leaving out some parts of the value chain and, um, and also how to work on, you know, how these guidelines could be used for a coalition. So maybe, uh, mm. you know, either a commodity or land, a landscape. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think the key point here is, is actually the bit I raised at the end, which is the enabling conditions. And what we're saying, we're not expecting companies to sit in isolation and figure out what they need to do on their own. It, it is absolutely essential that there is broader uh, discussion with different stakeholders as they go through this process. And I mean, again, it totally depends on the company, but also, I mean, Julia, some of the early work we also did with a power company as well. We've seen sometimes you'll get a plant or a factory right by an area of biodiversity importance, but it will be part of an industrial complex that has several other companies also operating there. So immediately you see that, you know, if, if there's going to be a, a credible biodiversity strategy there it needs to talk to neighboring companies uh, and then also obviously the you the other users of the natural resources that the company is potentially impacting or, or could impact as well so I think for me the, the, the highlight here and it, it also goes back to my point about conservation science conservation best practice 
for years now, conservationists have been saying that, again, it's not just a bunch of scientists that sit in a room and plan priorities for biodiversity. It's a big stakeholder uh, consultation exercise. Um, so I think it is about engaging uh, the relevant players. And as, as, as you um, alluded to, Julia, there are different ways that can be done as well. And, and, and what we've seen um, in certain countries, and you mentioned Brazil as an example, you do sometimes have communities coming together, um, farming communities uh, or people in the agricultural sector working together with the relevant companies that are buying their products to come up with a common plan for in the instance you mentioned a common watershed and so this also goes back to another thing we mentioned in the guidelines which is about wherever possible looking at the broader landscape because at the end of the day um you know however large the scope of biodiversity influence is for a given company um there will be other companies or other actors will in most cases have uh, even more of an impact as well so it's a matter of of, of planning um, in the broader landscape as well. And, and, and the guidelines go into that in quite a lot of detail. All right. Yeah, thank you, PJ, for this. Um, I have now, I pick a question for Katie. Um, I think this will be, I think you can answer this one. How do you convince companies in the financial sector that this applies to them? Ah, interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> Very so timely. There is a huge amount of work going on within the finance space as well and many financial institutions looking for similar things how how do they align their um their portfolios their financial portfolios with biodiversity goals as well so there is a lot of movement in this we um through some of the work with the biodiversity guidance we've piloted with some financial institutions so there is some some interest there and and I know that investors are beginning to actually join the science-based targets network as well so there is this movement uh, within the finance sector. There's a huge range of ongoing initiatives. We um, have started uh, through uh, continuation of the Encore tool. We're looking at developing a module within that where financial institutions could go to and look at how aligned their portfolios might be with, with biodiversity goals. So there is also a need alongside this, this push to, for corporates to be measuring biodiversity performance, also for this to be happening within the finance sector. Um, and I think both, both can push each other to do better as well. So yeah, there's a number of other ongoing initiatives within that space too. Yeah, thank you, Katie. And so to complement this, just uh, for example, in the annex one of the guidelines, you will see some of these um, specific processes or tools for financial institutions mentioned there so that um, it's more clear you know, from the investor perspective, how they can assess their footprint you know, impacts dependency, maybe a little bit less, but certainly impacts of their portfolio and that we have mentioned them because it's, as we mentioned, the idea is that these guidelines apply to all sectors. And of course, they have different, you know, different levels of control and any influence on their footprint. And it's actually something that some of our partners will explain later, but not, uh, notwithstanding that, it is important that every company independently where they stand in the value chain take responsibility. Thank you. As Katie, as I have you here, actually, there was a question about um, about uh, the, where is it? Science-based targets are related to emission reductions. What is the difference between with science-based na uh, for nature? What is the central go goal according to the context? Yeah. So I, I saw the question come in. A really good question, and I think. Um, there's obviously lots of work still needed. So there is initial guidance on science-based targets for nature, but still more work needed around that. But what the guidance at the moment does is, is frame itself around um, the state of nature and pressures on nature. So by looking at the state of nature, looking to, to set targets around uh, things that are related to the ecosystems, species, and nature's contributions to people. And then for pressures looking uh, at a similar, like an, uh, framing similar to used in the IPBES global assessment to look at pressures on nature from land, water um, and sea use change, resource exploitation, climate change, pollution and invasive species. So at the moment the science-based targets for nature are framed around that concept and looking at target setting for that and that is while the there is ongoing work within the, the science basis of this, um, this uh, network to look at 
what the earth's limits are and actually defining those and those thresholds so these are ways in which interim targets could could be set now okay yeah thank you katie so and of course if there is more um interest in this issue you can always write to iucn and then we'll put you in contact with katie and the science-based target network um so a question from jar boss uh, I think this would be more for you, PJ, or myself. What are ma the main changes that we did after the recent consultation process of the guidelines? I'd like to hear from you, and then I can. Well, tell you uh, I think well, the first thing that springs to mind was clearly. I think we we heard a lot, as we always do. I mean, as as Katie has demonstrated nicely, there are quite a few initiatives at the moment. I mean, the business and biodiversity space is quite crowded at the moment, and that's simply because there is an urgent need. That we find solutions that businesses are after to um, address biodiversity, uh, and <laughs> the other point is it's not easy. So there are several there are several different initiatives uh, away, and so every time there is a discussion, um, obviously we try and relate to the other discussions ongoing too. And that was great, uh, Katie, summarising some of the key ones there too. But I think uh, in response to Gerard's question, one of the things we've done was we noted people saying, "Well, how do the guidelines relate?" to these guidelines or to that standard. And even in the chat and so forth here now, I'm seeing several people mention um, other guidelines and so forth as well. What we ended up doing as a result of the feedback we got in the public consultation was making sure we actually put more detail than we planned to do into the annexes to kind of create this tool. And it did take some time, but with all the links and the updates to where companies can look. And because sometimes companies do also want sector specific guidance. Uh, Ours is generic. We've shown that it does apply to several different sectors, but some also would like to see um, sector-specific guidance on certain, certain aspects. So I think that's what we've done. We will, going forward, keep that updated and we'll work with partners to make sure that that, that is as updated as possible. Um, but I think, for me, that was one main change, Julia. So maybe you'll have another one that I forgot. Yeah, so the other one I had is, the, um, I think, the the integration of the dependency aspect of it, because I think originally we were very focused on impacts and then we got a real shake there from one of our peer reviewers saying, hey, what about the, the dependencies? You know, how do you incorporate those? I mean, and I thought, you know, originally probably is because we assumed that people were, would have considered, but especially if you're looking at manufacturing, they might be a bit too far away from the ground to actually yeah. put them into the priorities. And so I think I hope we have done a good, you know, good job in in using, you know, basically putting them at the same level of um, the impacts in the prioritization phase really early on, so that even from a manufacturing perspective, they can understand better what are not just their impact, but where do they depend on, and you know, linking to, for example, from uh, you know farming and so on. So that's to me was I think the biggest. In addition to what you said, you know, having actually the table that we talked about that Katie presented was uh, one of the big changes actually we added towards more towards the end. Yeah, as a second part of the consultation. Yeah. Uh, so there was another one that it's interesting. Well, I'm looking at the top ones, and then as I said, you know, there will be others. We will answer that all, but. Um, about scope and prioritization is in is key. Can you say something about the different tiers and supply chain impacts and how business can prevent a scope that is too narrow and intentionally leaving out major impacts on dependencies? PJ, we have that discussion a few times. So what do you recall about that? Uh, I'm trying to think what you're sort of leading me on to what answer you want to give to. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think so. The challenge, and this is what we've also said as well in terms of how companies apply the guidelines. So one of the reasons we've got this aggregation unit issue in there as well is that we you know sometimes companies may not be ready if it, they have quite a complicated relationship with the environment to do everything at once. So in fact, what we're also saying is you may not want to go through this whole exercise right away for all of your operations and supply chains. You might actually want to start with one that to you seems uh, the most important. And I think for that reason, just to... And again, a lot of this also depends on the level of maturity of a company and how much it's already dealing with the environment. Some companies, ones we know of and we talk to, are already incredibly aware. They've done lots of different assessments. They're incredibly aware of uh, their supply chains and operations and how it relates to biodiversity. Others are, are really just starting that journey. And I think that's where 
they probably will need some extra help in trying to conduct those early uh, assessments. I mean, the, the um, priority section, we sort of call a, a situation analysis, uh, taken from sort of conservation biology speak, but that is incredibly important that companies try and look at, go through the process we're proposing, which start to say, well, what do you do? And okay, what is that gonna lead to in terms of impact on biodiversity? And how can you then go out prioritizing that? Yeah. We're, not, we're not proposing this as a standard. So we are not in a position to judge companies uh, on how they deliver. And so that's also something to keep in mind. This is guidance. So it's not for us to come in later and say, well, you didn't consider all of your pressures or all of your scope. But what we're hoping is more and more companies adopt these and um, take on board our recommendations and start to talk and work together on biodiversity strategic plans. We might start to see some harmony, certainly within sectors, uh, as well as between sectors. And then I, I would hope there would be a bit of peer pressure there too, to, for companies to call each other out um, uh, on, on the degree to which, the thoroughness to which they've done this. And of course, it, it's not impossible, and we touch on it in the guidelines, that when enough companies have actually um, tried the approach as well, it could be possible to compare levels of implementation if people felt that was a constructive thing to do in the long term. Over. Thank you, PJ. Um, a question from uh, Warwick uh, about um, the uh, feedback following the implementation of the guidelines and if possible link this to performance standards where possible and relevant for company sector. Um, maybe I'll take this one actually, because we have the example, well, Nespresso will talk about there and Nespresso has a very long um, tradition of using a performance standards. They use uh, their own AAA, but they also use external certification with the Rainforest Alliance. Um, but having seen other standards, like for example, in, in mining, I think implementing these guidelines could be really complementary to, you know, for a company that has uses as a tool, like as an implementation strategy, a certification scheme, because it could be really a way to make sure that you actually monitor the effectiveness of that certification scheme on the ground. Um, and so there are a number, you know, certification schemes will have a number of actions. You know, if you think about biodiversity, most likely they will tell you about implementing a biodiversity action plan, maybe reaching a certain goal like net, net gain or having other, you know, specific measures. And this already could help, you know, inform the, the, your, your corporate biodiversity basically strategy that we are talking about by extracting these elements and making them, you know, your core indicator. So I think is total complementary. One is your overarching framework and, uh, and the performance standard becomes your, your instrument, your delivery, you know, the way you deliver this. So uh, we have three more minutes before we move to the next session. I'll ask, uh, we have Sibyl here that is, uh, has asked a number of questions. And one is about if there is an initiative underway to encourage and propose to state partners that these guidelines are integrated in national policy, regulatory and fiscal frameworks. We wish, <laughs> but Katie, you have be also been part of some of this uh, more, um, you know, business for nature in this is not necessarily included in there, but I think there is a lot going on also in terms of influencing business trying to have a voice with governments and especially in relation to the CBD. Maybe Katie, you want to say something about also WCMC efforts in uh, in working with the CBD and influencing business um, governments? Yeah, absolutely, Julia. I think um, so uh, further to what I was saying before, that I not only needs businesses and financial institutions to be moving this agenda forward and, and looking more at plan planning and monitoring corporate biodiversity performance, but it also needs this influence from the policy space as well. So the developing CBD's um, post-2020 global biodiversity framework is obviously really important, really important for corporates and financial institutions to align with but it also needs to be business relevant. And so there's many suggestions being put forward by groups like Business for Nature, um, recommendations by, for example, the Aligning Biodiversity Measures uh, for Business Collaboration, talking about how do we ensure a business relevant post-2020 framework? And that comes down to, to some of the details that were in those questions as well. So policy space is super important, but yeah, Julia, PJ, open to your thoughts on that. Please. Yeah, I mean, at least from a UCN perspective, and I see also Hugo has a similar question, um, engagement of governments. 
I, I think absolutely it is critical that governments also catch up on the need for, for them to create that level playing field. And we, you know, this is common terminology. We have been talking about it. And uh, I think some of us have been part of this, uh, you know, on the mainstreaming work that has been led by CBD with the, a real detail kind of uh, recipe of saying, you know, you need as governments put these measures in place in order to bring, you know, to mainstream biodiversity in decision-making in businesses, for example. So from our side, from the IUCN perspective, for example, we have a number of roles in this, you know, global policies. We will make sure that we speak about the guidelines. We will promote the guidelines. Uh, and IUCN also has government members. So we will make sure that these also are communicated in a, in a tailor-made way, fashion to governments. Uh, but again, they're guidelines. These are not, it's not supposed to be a standard. Uh, we will work with others, you know, there is the whole GRI elements and there are others, and we want to make sure that they are used for what they're supposed to be used for, which is helping companies understand their footprint and come up with a, a good, strong, uh, credible set of goals, objectives, and indicators. But we will certainly communicate also to governments because they can create incentives for, for uh, companies to do that. So on this, I see a lot of interesting questions, but we need to move to the next uh, session. So I think uh, now will be PJ's role to, to start answering some questions in writing. And, then, and again, if uh, we don't have a chance to answer in writing uh, during the, the next hour and you still have this question, please write to us by your biz at IUCN.org. So now, thank you very much, Katie. Thank you, PJ. And thank I'm gonna now, now ask thank you. the next, uh, so our business partners. So I'm gonna, I'm calling Claire, Foco, Rosa, and Judy to join me, please. Hi, Julia, good afternoon. Hello. Hi, Julia. Here we are. Yeah, so, Julia. thank you for joining us. So, the um, first of all, just for the audience to quickly say why why the four of you uh, are here, and uh, because you are the three companies that helped us write these guidelines, um, took the the leap of faith, <laughs> really, literally, from an initial two page of this is what we are thinking, and you actually, you know, helped us write them, and uh, I just. Every time you know we we drafted, we kind of lost track of how many drafts of the guidelines. In fact, that we kind of st start dropping the number because we was coming really crazy. Because every time we were you know having a draft, we were sharing with you. We got comments, questions, you know, challenges, and then we were going back and rewriting them. So you are really have been you know um, incredibly uh, useful in writing them. But in addition to that, we have worked with you in developing a, a plan for you um and giving you recommendations on how you can use them so today is really about your opportunity to give us a little bit of a feedback on how you have experienced this year with IUCN so the session is organized in two you know two sub two sub sessions one is like a few two questions to each of you and then you're gonna have 10 minutes to present so I'll start with the question which is a very straightforward one which is what was your motivation for working with IUCN and applying the IUCN approach? And I'd like to start with Claire. Hi, well, firstly, thank you very much for having us here. It's been a very exciting, I think, year and a half nearly uh, working through these guidelines with you. Um, and in terms of why we wanted to be part of it, I think nature and biodiversity have been a long time uh, you know, important for Boscalis. We've been monitoring and measuring and managing environmental impact at the local level, at the project level for many years now. But uh, being a stock listed company, we're, we're also required to report at the corporate level. And I would say this you know, is still a challenge for us. How do we collate and aggregate that information across an entire and very complex portfolio? And I think working with the IUCN, it was also a credible organization uh, using a science-based approach that we could relate to. Um, it, we, we saw it as an opportunity also to sense check our existing biodiversity ambition. And increasingly we're talking in corporate level and in our communications around contributing to the sustainable development goals. 
but we want to be able to do this in a credible way. So we feel like we need to have the right data indicators and ways of um, reporting in order to do that in a, yeah, in a way that's credible to our stakeholders. And finally, I'd say there's also a commercial angle. We sit in this supply chain that's been in some of the questions people have uh, mentioned, I see. And you know, how can we also increase the demand for our, uh, our services that perhaps take advantage, you know, provide more positive contribution to biodiversity, like our nature-based solutions? So are there indicators we could find that would help us better um, commercialize these elements of our business as well? Thank you, Claire. Um... So Rosa, over to you. Same Thank question. you, Julia, and thanks for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to be part of this uh, presentation event. Um, so I'm here, as, as you very well know today, with two hats on one side um, on, with the Alcoa Foundation hat. So from the Alcoa Foundation perspective, uh, working with IUCN on, on the development of these guidelines, um, is just uh, one more step on a, on a long-term uh, partnership that, that we had with IUCN in different, um, in different projects over the last probably 15 years or so. So uh, when Julia introduced this project, we thought that it was really aligned uh, with our objectives to, to protect biodiversity, to preserve biodiversity. And, and we thought that it was a very valuable tool that many uh, companies and corporations with complex supply chains could really benefit from. So the Alcoa Foundation jumped into the opportunity to be a, part, a partner uh, to work on the guidelines. And then from the Alcoa side, um, uh, where, where, I, where I work as well, uh, this is certainly, and, and as Claire said before, it is uh, an absolute need of corporations with different lines of business or, or with different operating in different steps of the supply chain to have a way to integrate um, what, what we do on, on biodiversity conservation into some meaningful indicators that we can share uh, with the society, that we can share with our stakeholders so that we can really prove that, that we are doing the right thing. So um, all of this combined with the fact that IUCN is certainly a recognized leader in, in biodiversity conservation made it the package for us. So we are very happy to be part of the adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you very much. Um, Julie. I think they said it all. <laughs> Maybe what the audience doesn't know is indeed the long-standing relationship we have with IUCN 10 year already. Yes. And uh, going from responsible aluminium to landscape level action to the piloting of natural capital protocols. So it was relatively a natural step for us to get engaged into this process that has been over the last 24 months particularly because we also entered at this point in time, two, two years ago, a strategic review process of our sustainability journey end to end. Obviously we are a coffee company, so we, we sell coffee. We have a big focus on coffee. Julia just mentioned uh, uh, some specific actions we take uh, related to coffee and I will come back on that uh, later on during the presentation. But it's true that we have been doing a lot of things over the years uh, when it comes to actions and strategy, trying to identify impacts, but we were a bit struggling to uh, reconciliate all these pieces of the puzzle. And by doing this process and, uh, and working on, along the line of these uh, guidelines, we manage and uh, we have now a recommendation in our hands to now bring it to life, uh, to put all these elements together to definitely have this uh, corporate vision on how to best plan and monitor uh, biodiversity performance. And that was definitely uh, the main motivation. On top of that, of course, the fact that it connects with the other streams, and uh, Katie mentioned the, the, the science-based target for nature, uh, GRI, etc. For us, it's also uh, honestly a, a, a gift <laughs> to to uh, to have this uh, recommendation now in hand uh, to make also the bridge with other uh, elements of the conversation when it comes to biodiversity performance. Thank you, Julie. Um, Maybe so then a next question is really how does this approach relate to your existing sustainability work? Uh, Rosa, you want to go first? Sure, thank you, Julia. So yeah, I mean, it, it, Alcoa is a company that operates bauxite mines in, in the Amazonia, that operates aluminum refineries in places like Western Australia, and operates aluminum smelters in, in industrial areas in Canada. 
So the challenges are completely different in terms of biodiversity and the solutions are completely different. So um, we, we said uh, biodiversity policy, we understand what we have to do at corporate level. We understand what are our targets, but then um, our, biggest, uh, our biggest gap is, is how do we measure? How do we communicate that uh, this is what we are doing and, and how do we share our challenges and our successes uh, with others, right? So this is a critical piece of uh, our sustainability practice today. Uh, there is a request for more transparency. It is a, a civil society, the society in general is asking for more transparency. And this is not about, uh, you know, just, just not wanting to share, it's, it's about the ability to, to, to share the right metrics. So this is where it fits really well with Alcoa. We really need this tool. Uh, we are on, on the path. We are, we are following this path to, to be able to, to be more transparent um, and, and answer those questions. And, um, and it came at the right moment. So we, we are very happy and excited about the, the next steps. Thank you, Rosa. Um, Foco, over to you. Thanks, uh, Julia, and also thank you for uh, for having me in this uh, in this session. Um, yeah, so biodiversity is uh, is already one of our five focus areas in our sustainability strategy. So we do consider it in um, in the protection um, uh, protection of biodiversity and the incorporation uh, of it into our um, environmental and social management. Um, so besides the monitoring and the reporting of these uh, impacts on biodiversity, we, uh, we also look for innovative solutions to address the challenges uh, related to biodiversity and actually look for positive uh, contributions. And this is very much similar to what IGN has been doing on the nature-based solutions. We've also been investing in uh, what we call building with nature or nature-based solutions for water-related infrastructure. Um, and in that work, uh, we have learned, besides all the technical aspects, that actually collaborating with NGOs, uh, with other sectors, with governments, um, with knowledge institutes and organizations like, NG like uh, IUCN, um, that is actually crucial to understand each other's language on this uh, topic. And that's, that very much that takes, that takes time. We have also learned uh, in our collaboration that um, it takes time to understand each other, uh, uh, what you're talking about. Uh, and I believe that the IUCN approach that we have applied uh, has greatly contributed to uh, the increase in understanding of, of, uh, of, of biodiversity monitoring and reporting uh, at, at our corporate level. So that's, um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's been great. Thank you, Foco. Julie. So where does it fit with our work? Actually, we've been uh, indeed involved in two uh, sustainable coffee sourcing for quite a while now, it will be soon 20 years. We have this uh, program where we have the traceability of the coffee we buy and we buy year on year from the same farmers because this is the a strong conviction we have that uh, if we want to offer a certain promise of high quality coffee to our consumers, we want to make sure that, uh, or we, we know it comes from a healthy ecosystem and also only thriving communities. It, it cannot be another way because uh, as we buy from specific landscapes, uh, if this landscape is degraded, we know that uh, uh, it, it's going to be, um, you know, bad for this dependency will be bad for the, the, the quality of the coffee. So that, that's the starting point. But of course, uh, over the years, and as I say, related to also the long-standing relationship with uh, IUCN, we learned a lot because uh, business, as a business, we are not nature fluent, as I say. We need to learn uh, how to manage that nature, uh, how to really understand this impact and the dependencies. And uh, I, I did mention a minute ago, uh, 24 months ago, we started the strategic review process to prepare for the next journey. We are closing uh, the sequence in 2020 of uh, you know, a journey that, that started in 2014. And we really wanted to know, uh, you know where to go. So we had a clear vision for agriculture, for coffee agriculture, that we call regenerative agriculture. And I will come back in a minute on that. But we, we didn't know indeed how to put that vision into something very tangible when it comes to outcome. And uh, as part of this process, uh, we, we, I think we manage now to better connect this vision we have for agriculture with some specific, specific goals and objectives and, and some indicators definitely uh, that will be uh, 
uh, able to uh, to monitor over the years to know if we progress, if we put the right investment at the right uh, moment in the right uh, in the right areas. So that's uh, how it fits into our work mm -hmm. for the moment, and uh, soon uh, putting into practice. Oh, actually, this Julie, um, our, we can move now to the next uh, phase, which is really having a, a proper presentation about your how you have used the guidelines, and we start from you actually. So you can continue basically on this on the what you were talking about. Excellent. So you can see all my screen. Yeah. And yes, I'll excellent. stop my video. And so that's just so now I need to make sure my slides go down. It doesn't move for the moment. But uh, oops. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. You have to click on the on the slide and then yes. Ah uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Right, so I put that back because just to make sure the the rationale of this whole uh, of this whole process, as I say, was really uh, it comes from the report we IUCN wrote for the recommendation, and, and really it's about we've been doing a lot, but we were struggling to really putting this uh, unifying approach when it comes to the narrative and the indicators, so that we could see at a corporate level where we stand in our process. So really, uh, what I'm going to present today is the learnings or the experience we had over the last 24 months putting together this, uh, this um, you know, the guidelines into, into applications for Nespresso, thanks to PJ and Julia really giving a, a great support. And not only uh, uh, remaining at a level which is, uh, let's say, desktop or literature review, but also really trying to aggregate what we had been doing uh, for the last 17 years on, uh, on uh, coffee sourcing and particularly the, the sustainable practices we had put in place. So I will go through the four stage that uh, PJ presented uh, for the, the, the guidelines. So the setting the priorities, uh, putting an ambition, then coming with indicators, and then really making sure we would implement the, the framework. And I, what I will try to do, because the idea is not to come back on what PJ presented, but rather to give you my Big breakthrough or my big wow <laughs> when doing this job uh, together with uh, with PJ and Julia. And what you can see here is the cover page of this report that will come out soon externally. We are finalizing the, the last uh, bits and pieces to make it available for anyone willing to learn a bit more about uh, about this process as well into application for our business. So maybe the the, the first one related to the the priority. I think uh, PJ earlier on mentioned the, the, the whole uh, stage one is really unpacking the complexity of biodiversity and also passing from what we usually uh, look at, which is the, the pressure element, the priority on pressure, to priorities when it comes to species, habitats, and ecosystem services. And I think one of the, um, again, the big breakthrough moment where, when we went through that whole process was first to get guidance from specialists, from experts on what we should really look at uh, based also on what we had been doing over the years. So identifying some species, and here we, uh, for the moment, the recommendation is to say you, we could focus on five species at, 12, uh, uh, at least, sorry. Um, starting with birds, we have a specific uh, monitoring uh, project uh, happening right now in Colombia and um, Costa Rica and also Nicaragua uh, on bird monitoring. And we could definitely leverage that into, into the framework, but also, as you can see here, could be also on trees, because again, we have a, a, a program uh, ongoing uh, of agroforestry deployment that we could definitely leverage into qualifying more uh, specific species uh, for, for better biodiversity performance. Uh, so same for habitats and uh, same for ecosystem services. We, uh, we, we get guided on uh, how, you know, what to look at more specifically when it comes to the, uh, the areas and the regions where we source our coffee. But what I thought was more, mostly interesting was the fact that to aggregate at the corporate level, we had to add priorities that resonate both at global and national levels. And here, what you see in this table is really the connection between something that that is our vision at global level or priorities at global levels with specific names of birds or, or trees at local level. And in that case, it's Costa Rica. And not just names, but I want to show you what it looks like when it comes to uh, really uh, uh, identifying those priorities. Uh, one of the birds in Costa Rica is this one. It's the, the three-watered uh, uh, belly bird. Um, 
And, and again, if I, if I show these pictures, because it's not just a paperwork or a desktop work, as I say. of this guideline is really to put the guide, the recommendation into practice. So we also need to get full ownership of what we are talking about. And by really designating and showing pictures of what we are talking about, it will also be one of the enabler factors. So I think that's, uh, that's really what was important for me in this uh, setting priorities was really to be tangible and actionable with what we were doing uh, in the countries of origin. When it comes to the number two, um, the stage number two about the goals and objectives, uh, indeed, as I said, we, we were talking about or talking, uh, thinking about uh, what is the next journey for uh, the sustainable coffee agriculture we have been promoting for, uh, for now 17 years. And uh, based on you know, all the challenges, all the conversation, we did actually two years ago together with PJ and Julia a huge landscape screening of all the things that were happening at the time to really identify what could be the hook in, on which uh, our company could be really building the future. And this notion of regenerative coffee agriculture came out as an evidence, I would say, uh, to really uh, encapsulate this idea of uh, all the actions we could do to address the key challenges that we had ahead of us, named uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and of course the, the resilience of the community, because there is no way neither to, to set up a vision that doesn't take into consideration the social element. And for us, it's really important we, we set up a vision of a profitable agriculture. Because of course, you know, there is a, always this tension between talking just on environment and then looking at the people on the other side, but we really wanted to have a vision that uh, encapsulates the two ideas. And here you see, hopefully better than I, because I see a lot of things on my screen, uh, but uh, what uh, it looks like uh, in terms of defining two goals and five objectives, so related to the two goals. So we have really two goals, one related to farm action, so it's really related to practices that are happening on farms, while the second goal is more uh, things that are happening in the landscape to make sure we protect that landscape and we restore in case uh, the landscape has been degraded. So it's really giving you a bit more insight on how we articulated the goals and objectives with our visions, but as well with action and strategies. Again, that we are not just brand new, but also building on what we have been doing the past years. When it comes to indicators, another huge breakthrough for me that uh, was presented at the beginning of this session called the pressure state response and benefit. I think that that's amazing because probably one of the main things we struggled over the years was to do this link between the, the KPIs we were, we were monitoring. And with this notion of pressure state response and benefits, and here you have an example here of what it could what it looks like. So really uh, uh, starting with, uh, uh, with the response is really, uh, uh, you know, looking at how we can um, put in place some response that reduce pressure. So for instance, on threatened trees in that case, to look at the number of native threatened trees that, uh, that have been planted. Uh, and in response to, to this response, uh, looking at the, the pressure it, it creates, so uh, less pressure on, on uh, forest uh, and land use change. Um, and then going into uh, really the, the, the state of the diversity. So here the, the indicator is called the abundance and diversity of native, native tree species. Then into the benefits for the communities that, that comes out of, uh, of this, uh, let's say, stable and healthy ecosystems. And in that case would be the income from the agroforestry and forest products. So basically, I will not go through the 40 different indicators that have come in the recommendation, but the idea was to really look at uh, the, the goals and objectives through the, the lens of the pressure state response and benefits we could uh, monitor uh, against uh, the specific uh, actions. So I, I think that was, as I say, uh, for me, the, the most, the most uh, or the breaking element in the discussion when I, I started to think, oh, okay, so we will definitely rely potentially on experts for when it comes to the um, the state of biodiversity, because that's not something we can collect on our own, while potentially the response related to specific practices we put in place, that's something we could, we could collect ourselves through the network of agronomists that, that is uh, visiting uh, 
the, the farmers uh, on, a, on a very regular basis. So that was for this, uh, the experience we had on uh, setting the indicators related to our goals and action. And last but not least, again, that's a statement coming from the, the report itself, uh, from PJ probably, <laughs> saying there is no point in collecting data if we if we don't act on it or if, if they are not being used. And definitely, the worst case scenario is that we collect things and we don't do anything out of that. And um, and uh, with again with the recommendation, the idea was to make sure that in the implementation part. Uh, the, all the, the strategy that has been put in place will be able to be actionated by the people uh, at the field level. And um, the implementation of, uh, of the recommendation will, of course, depend on various success factors. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll finish with the dashboard because probably the dashboard is more for the, the corporate level. But uh, it will be depending on the building of specific capabilities, the collaboration with uh, our partners. Uh, as I said, we, we've been uh, now for 17 years working with, uh, with an array of partners. And, and definitely this pro project, or if I can say that, or this uh, framework will be uh, socialized with our partner to make sure that everyone understands uh, the, the mindset that is behind this recommendation. And, uh, and then being contributing to feeding the overall uh, journey, uh, particularly when it comes to evaluation, because indeed, uh, at the end of the day, it's about planning, but it's also about monitoring, and uh, monitoring to indeed have this vision at corporate level of where we stand in our journey. So it's, it's really about building this dashboard. And again, um, PJ presented at the beginning what it can look like. So that's something we will be putting in place uh, hopefully very soon to, uh, to, to, to you know, activate or bring to life these tables I just showed you uh, previously uh, into uh, a dashboard so that we can really get at uh, any time the situation of the, of the progress and re reallocate uh, investment if needed. And of course, last but not least, the communication part. Uh, with uh, some of our partners, and I take the case of uh, BIRDS, uh, our partners have started to, to communicate uh, the, uh, the work that is being done on the farm uh, on bird monitoring. So in that case, it's the Cornell University uh, Laboratory of, uh, of Ornithology. They set up some Instagram accounts, for instance, where we can follow uh, where you know the, the work that is being done on uh, bird monitoring and the kind of birds that we can find on coffee farms and how we can uh, then uh, better protect their habitats for these birds. So that's uh, for me right now. I think I managed to keep my 10 minutes. And uh, <laughs> as an overall conclusion, it's really uh, now about putting that into practice. So the two goals, five objectives, 14 indicators, and uh, 16 priorities that uh, comes from the recommendation of IUCN. Thank you, Julie. And I love the fact that you didn't say, oh my God, we have too many, but because it's exactly the, you know, the, the conclusion is we need this uh, richness of goals and in in objectives and in indicators to be able to describe the richness of biodiversity is not a straightforward metric. And, um, I love the working with you because it was, you know, it's something that has been going on for years, working at the site level. And this was a perfect example of how you bring the, the diversity, the richness in, of different sites and, you know, in different clusters and countries and in regions of the world into a more simplified, unified uh, vision that you can discuss in Lausanne. So I think we are. Exactly. We, are, we haven't we haven't finished yet, but we are almost yeah. there. Yeah, and and yet, as I say, for me, what what really matters is what happens on the field because at the end of the day, exactly. it's really the, the 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 change and the transformation will happen on yes. the field. But we are at able at corporate level in Lausanne to get an to idea understand. of where we stand. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Julie. Now. Um, without further ado, I move to Claire and Foco, who have also their presentation on their experience in, in implementing the guidelines. 10 minutes to you. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Just let me uh, try to share my screen.
Can you see the slides? It's perfect. Great. Well, again, thank you for um, having us today. Uh, we'll try and whiz through an uh, overview of the work we've done to date and applying the guidelines in Boscalis, uh, together with my colleague Foco. But first of all, I'll give you a quick introduction to Boscalis and what we do, as you may not be familiar with us. We're a global uh, dredging and offshore contractor. Um, we're busy, act we're active in the construction of ports and waterways. Yeah, you might sorry, just, sorry oh. to interrupt you. It's in, in presentation. Uh, oh, it's still in mode. presentation mode. Oh, then let me try and change that. Thank you, Foko. Um, how do I change that? Display I think it should be display maybe. setting, yeah. Uh -uh, it's not letting me do that. Claire, do you want do you want us to present? Let me. Oh, I see, yeah, Foco, you can take over. If I stop sharing, or I can try sharing it again and not put presenter view on. You want me to do it, Claire? Foco. I'll do it. Okay, well, yeah, I can see if you go to the next slide. So as I was uh, mentioning, we're active in dredging and offshore contracting. This is a picture of our project uh, happening uh, starting last year in 2020, which is coastal protection. We are, um, yeah, for many years being a Dutch company, we've been busy with uh, coastal protection, river protection, and um, other works that we do with our vessels includes large rec reclamations. You perhaps don't know us by name, but for example, if you've flown into Hong Kong, uh, the, the land that you flew into, we've reclaimed. We've also been active with, for example, port reclamation like uh, the port of Rotterdam. If you could go to the next slide. More recently, we've moved uh, also into providing services for the offshore energy business. And this includes transport and installation of offshore wind farms, of um, transporting oil and gas platforms, decommissioning of such platforms. We also have a large uh, marine survey business. This is actually um, the uh, first floating wind farm that we're towing a, a couple of turbines out uh, offshore of Scotland. If you go to the next. A third part of our business is our salvage business where we are active in um, wreck removal and emergency response uh, in the marine environment. And this is an area of our business where we're actually actively um, I guess, uh, recovering um, oil or hazardous cargo from the marine environment. We have a global footprint. Uh, we're active in around 90 countries at any one moment. We have around 10,000 employees. And um, I think what's important here, however, is, is, is we fly well, fly in, we sail in and we sail out typically. So in many of these locations that you see around the world, we're only there for a very short period of time. We're there for the project, we complete the project and then we leave. As Foco mentioned earlier, we our sustainability strategy has five, um, five pillars essentially in terms of our material topics and biodiversity is one of these. Uh, we report on these as a company um, every year as part of our annual reporting. And this is really an area that we're trying to mature. In terms of bringing us to the next level in how we understand our biodiversity impact and reporting and communicating on that biodiversity impact, we wanted to try to apply the guidelines to discover these uh, handful of core indicators this almost you know it, it's a very very complex topic but we really would like to be able to credibly measure and communicate the impact of our business on biodiversity um, from a adverse uh, perspective but also a positive perspective 
And to date, we've worked through the IUCN guidelines, um, primarily stage one and stage two. Um, we, we're, we're started on stage three, which Foco will talk to you about in a moment. And I think it's also important to mention that we have this very complex organization and we've taken that step to um, focus on one part of our business in an initial stage. And we're going to hopefully um, take that broader as we go forward. One of the, um, I guess, the great things about the guidelines and the great things about going through this process um, as a company like ours was it really stimulated some discussion. We needed to look at our scope and our influence and our place in the supply chain um, makes the um, impact that we have on biodiversity, we don't always have influence over it. And that's, um, that's because when we go into a project, which is, for example, a port project, which needs a, a reclamation or a waterway to be constructed, the decision's already been made on that location of that project or uh, perhaps the master plan design of that project before we come along. And so we're having to work already within the confines of that um, project that's already been developed. And as I said at the beginning, we're also temporary visitors to a project site, typically speaking in the majority of cases. So how do we, how do we measure our impact on biodiversity when we go in and we go out? And, um, and finally, in one location, we're also often there with many others. So we're not the only person or the only organization active in one of our locations. So these were some of the dilemmas that we had to discuss and we were able to have some constructive conversations around and to take us into the next steps of how we actually going to apply that and to learn from this in terms of reporting on our biodiversity in our organization. On that note, I'll hand over to Foco to get into some of those details. Yeah, thanks, Sarah Claire. Um, so Claire explained about our, uh, let's say, the, the corporate view of uh, on, on biodiversity. Uh, I would like to dive in a little bit on the details of our of our projects. Um, so together with Julia and PJ, we um, we we run through our our portfolio of different types of projects um, uh, through our divisions, but also different type of contracts we have with clients so for example sometimes we only uh we have a very small responsibility in a very large chain of events and sometimes we have a very large responsibility over over the same uh a chain of events for example projects where we have design and engineering responsibilities or we're also responsible responsible for the maintenance period after the construction phase um so the the uh, the responsibility of uh, Boscalas at a certain location varies a lot. Um, so that makes it indeed complex to come up with a corporate biodiversity strategy. Um, so to, to identify the common pressures, compression areas, um, we, um, we, we, had, we went through um, together with PJ and, um, and Julia through all these sites um, and we came up with a list that um, that is applicable to, um, to most of our areas. However, we still need to identify and to uh, test how that should work in, um, in practice. Um, besides the projects, we have had an extensive discussions with our, um, uh, with, uh, with our uh, in-house ecologists, with our quality uh, team, with our uh, way of working team. The way of working is our, basically our, our quality um, uh, um, uh, program, how we uh, manage our projects and documentations and report and monitoring. Um, and we looked at the overall environmental processes. And through this, we have identified, let's, uh, like I said, the main pressures on the biodiversity of the Boscalis activities. We have identified the priority species and habitats related to those pressures. Um, and we also um, reviewed the existing processes that we have uh, already in place. Um, because we, uh, like I explained, we have um, uh, especially with regards to environmental management, uh, very strict requirements from our clients, but they are all always project based. So there's always an interaction between the project and our clients with regard to environmental management, but there's very little of this data flowing back into our organization at corporate level where we can identify an overall um, impact on, for example, biodiversity. So this is one of the first thing we are uh, we did together with PJ and Julia, and we are implementing now is to see uh, what do we do already, 
that can be linked to biodiversity at a corporate level. Uh, what do we monitor and what do we report and how can we stream these, uh, these data flows that, so that we can report on it. And also, um, of course, eventually we can make uh, um, a positive progress uh, on this. Um, so with regards to our traditional way of working, we have identified three um, key pressures, um, and these are re these relate to spills, stability, which is what, uh, related to water quality, and the introduction of invasive species, which is linked to our um, uh, uh, to our fleets. Um, in addition, we have identified the priority habitats and species that we can um, uh, that we can relate them uh, to. Um, like I mentioned in the, in the very beginning during the Q&A, um, besides managing our negative impact or reducing our negative impact, which is a, a very reactive way of managing our, pro our projects, we are always looking for opportunities to create a more positive impact. And we do this through our building with nature approach. Um, and this approach, uh, we aim to include the forces of nature uh, to make them a fundamental part, an integral part of our design. For example, by creating uh, soft sea defenses or using the creation of wetlands to improve water quality or to apply uh, application of artificial reefs in um, um, uh, reef restoration and coastal protection works. Um, so these contribute to our primary goal of delivering a project. Uh, and we also want to link them now to uh, our positive impact on biodiversity. So this work, um, identifying the key uh, aspects of minimizing our negative impact and identifying the key aspects of creating a positive impact has resulted in the um, uh, formulation of a Boscalis biodiversity framework, which has been presented uh, uh, two weeks ago um, through our CSR report, uh, our annual CSR report. Um, and this focuses on these two aspects. So from bottom up, um, reducing the negative uh, impact uh, and going more upwards, creating a positive impact to the application of nature-based based solutions and the inclusion of habitats um, uh, restoration into our uh, work. Um, with regards to progress, we have recently, for, uh, we have only just now uh, published the, uh, the framework um, and we are now rolling out the, uh, the indicators we have identified together with PJ uh, uh, on our projects. Um, the, the originally uh, um, formulated um, uh, um, indicators are very much focused, are very much based on a, a scientific approach, and we now need to translate them to a, to a, a more practical, um, uh, practical um, uh, indicator, so they, they can be applied by our uh, project teams, which are not only not always uh, equipped with uh, scientific-based uh, uh, ecologists and uh, marine biologists. So they need to be practical, they need to be applicable, and they need to be also be conf uh, conform uh, throughout our organization so that we can report on them um, at, a, at an annual basis. Um, this takes time to develop, but we are rolling this out currently uh, at several of on our projects, and we aim to upskill this uh, at the corporate level from on uh, next, uh, next year. Um, so lessons and outlook. Um, like I said, we are testing the indicators uh, currently at the project level. Um, we are identifying the current uh, reporting streams we have relates to the environment and how we can tweak them so they can also be applied to the, uh, the biodiversity aspects. Uh, but more importantly, we are also taking the steps to have a dialogue with our clients and with our investors uh, on how to incorporate biodiversity requirements into large scale uh, infrastructure. Um, like I mentioned, as a as a company, as a corporate company, we get more and more responsibilities, uh, not only from technical aspects but also managing environment and social aspects. Uh, and we want to include these uh, requirements uh, also from a very very early beginning in a project design, so we can uh, optimize uh, our impact on a uh, uh, positive impact on the biodiversity from a very early beginning of our uh, uh, involvement. Um, okay, may I, sorry, I need to interrupt you. I really feel sorry, but we have 15 more minutes and I really okay. also need to this is, this is actually the last uh, last point okay. I want to make cool. when the presentation is finished. So, um, uh, because that last point, is, uh, last point is important, the collaboration with NGOs, organizations like ICN is crucial for taking uh, bringing this uh, further. Uh, and I would also like to uh, point out that 
the role of a contractor in this uh, uh, in this process uh, is important. So um, a collaboration throughout uh, various sectors on this topic um, um, it needs to be done. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Thank you, Foco. Um, while Rosa is presenting, maybe Claire or you can put the link in the chat on where to find your framework that on your sustainability report. Okay. We'll do that. All right. So I will now, Rosa, over to you. I need to find your presentation because I'll be presenting on your, not you present, but I do the slides. Thank you very much, Julia. Yeah. So if, yeah, in the benefit of time, we can go to the to the next, the first slide. And what I would like to share with you here is the, um, okay, I, okay, my video, yeah. I, I would like to show you the, the footprint of Algoa because this, this really plays a role in what we are discussing here about finding a way to report at corporate level about an issue like biodiversity performance, which is so different in different places, which means so different things in different places of the world. So our challenge is that we are mining bauxite in the Amazonia in Brazil, also in the south of Brazil in Minas Gerais, but also in the Yarra Forest in uh, Western Australia, uh, which is completely different. And we are, um, we are uh, refining aluminum in Western Australia and, and in Europe. And we have aluminum smelters in Canada, the US and, and Europe and Australia. Um, so what is important here is that we are a value-driven company, which means that our values act with integrity, operate with excellence and care for people. They are exactly the same and apply exactly in the same manner all across the world. And just to know that we have also Guinea and Saudi Arabia on the map. Um, in Guinea and Saudi Arabia, we are a minority partner in joint ventures with, where we do not have operating responsibility. But even in these cases, what we try to do is to influence the JVs through our position in, in the governance structure and also bring those values to life. So this is the challenge we have. How do we um, manage biodiversity challenges through all those jurisdictions and bring that to a level where we can talk about it at corporate level? So if you go to the next slide, please, Julia. I would like, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I would like to share with you the strategic priorities of Alcoa. So we have three strategic priorities for the corporation. This is what we share with everybody, including our shareholders. One of them is reduce complexity. The other one is re drive returns. But the third one and equally important is fund sustainably. And I think it is important to note that even this is, if this is a strategic priority that we announced uh, a year ago, it is important to notice that we have a history of environmental performance. So, I'm, I'm very proud to say that um, Alcoa was globally recognized for bauxite mine rehabilitation already in, in 1990. We received this United Nations environmental program um, that was called the Global 500 Roll of Honor. And actually we were the only mining company listed, which was quite a step if we think that this was 30 years ago. And in 2003, we also won uh, a global award, which was called the Model Project Award for the Society of e for Ecological Restoration. So uh, this is, you know, this is uh, new in many ways in the sense that public opinion and expectations from stakeholders has put a, a, a very uh, intense focus on biodiversity conservation. But um, actually, we were talking about uh, or mainstreaming biodiversity. Uh, conservation already in 2005, and in Western Australia, we were already describing the application of the, of the mitigation hierarchy, which today is a expectation um, that is common for all the companies, but it was not the same case 15 years ago. So this is our starting point, and this is how biodiversity conservation uh, relates uh, to, to our sustainability work, and actually the work of, um, of IUCN relates to what we do. So. Um, just uh, beyond that, uh, we launched in, in 2020 a new policy and a new standard that commits Alcoa to no net loss of biodiversity for new operations and major expectations. So now we need to walk the talk and we need to implement this standard and be able to prove that we are um, meeting our commitments. And this is where IUCN um, 
um, guidelines and to measure biodiversity at, at corporate level uh, have an important role to play. So if you move to the next slide, Julia, uh, thank you very much. So the guidelines, as you have said at the beginning of this discussion, they really provide uh, this, this uh, framework to take site level biodiversity indicators and aggregating them uh, at corporate level. And this is obviously very, very useful to report externally, but also internally. So what does it mean for Alcoa? As I said, our biodiversity standard is designed to drive consistent approach to biodiversity management using the traditional risk assessment methodologies. And um, it accounts for things uh, like, uh, for instance, um, the recognition of high conservation values, uh, like for instance, threatened species or protected areas is, is covered in our risk assessment process. Then the next step is, is to account, um, you know, to define these action plans that, that are linked uh, to, to our uh, challenges. And these action plans have to have also um, indicators uh, to prove how we are performing and to communicate how much we have advanced. And these are just two examples of two very different things. Mining bauxite in the middle of the Yarra Forest in Western Australia is totally different from operating a smelter in Norway, where um, we need to monitor our discharges to a marine environment. Uh, we need to monitor migratory species that have nothing to do with, with Western Australia. So um, this is our challenge and, and this is what we need to resolve. So if you move to the next slide, Julia, um, this is just uh, in terms of, uh, and, and we touched a little bit on this in my previous uh, question before. So um, what motivates Alcoa to work with IUCN? Well, we mentioned this increasing requirements uh, for transparency across all sustainability dim dimensions. And I mentioned that we have these goals. Um, and established for biodiversity. But when you think about other performance area of the environmental profile, um, certainly measuring your, uh, your performance in waste and uh, you know, waste recycling, uh, waste to landfill is quite straightforward. Measuring water, measuring emissions is quite straightforward. We also have developed quite uh, some good indicators for mine rehabilitation. But now we need to go this, uh, this next step. And this is to, um, to incorporate these biodiversity indicators and to achieve the goal of having a um, uh, uh, consolidated corporate uh, number or indicator or set of indicators that we can use to further um, uh, provide information on our performance. So my last slide here, thank you, Julia, is how are we using these guidelines and what are our next steps? So in 2020, we worked with IUCN uh, to review and assess biodiversity performance in a couple of places. So this was a two-way communication. We provided information to IUCN on what we are doing and the indicators we are using. And IUCN just did a review of that to provide us some, um, some ideas, some observations on how uh, we improve this. So the outcomes were um, actually uh, the identification of a number of strengths. So for instance, uh, we have the right ambitions, we, we have policies and systems in place uh, to manage biodiversity. And, and this is of particular importance in the area of mine rehabilitation. But it also pointed to a number of weakness points. And these weaknesses relate exactly to this lack of overarching biodiversity framework that would allow, uh, allows us to aggregate results and to really have an overview of corporate level biodiversity performance. So this is the reason why we are moving in, we're gonna uh, move into in 2021. So we have incorporated it in the plan for this year to develop and agree on corporate level biodiversity strategy and associated objectives, unifying what we do at site level into a corporate level. So this is what we have included in our 2021 plan, which could be aligned with the stage two of the guidelines. And we will also try to identify and test a number of appropriate indicators or performance metrics to improve this corporate level visibility, but also to improve decision making and eventually external reporting, uh, which is um, what, what relates to stage three of the guidelines. 
And then um, hopefully by the end of this year, we will be in a better position uh, to plan on our future work that will be the evaluation to adapt indicators and internal systems um, to, to, to the needs of Alcoa. And this is gonna be stage four that hopefully uh, we will be in a position to start working on in 2022. So Julia, I tried to summarize my slides in five minutes uh, to cover up for a, a few of the minutes that, that we are behind. So um, thank you again for the opportunity. It has really been a pleasure to be part of this event. Back to you. Julia, you are muted. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you all to the speak to all the speakers. Um, I know we have five more minutes uh, to go over the conclusion, so I I will just dash because I don't want to lose people in the you know I just want to give them an overview of where we stand. Um, but again, thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Foco. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Katie and PJ for your incredible contribution and all the people that have submitted questions. Um, just to give you a quick overview of where we stand. So the, down, the guidelines you have received the, the link. Um, I, I just want to spend the last five minutes about telling you how we, how we got here. Well, you already heard a bit of the story, part of the story. We have really worked very closely with Nespresso, Boscalis and Alcoa in developing the guidelines. And you now, after you have heard the presentation, you know how this happened. You know, they used it, they implemented it. But while they were using it, they were giving us uh, feedback. And so it was like a real two-way conversation that lasted more than a year and was really enriching. Despite also the confinement, we were able to visit some places. Actually, with Foco, we had an amazing, you know, with Foco and Claire, we had amazing um, site visits, virtual basically, with amazing pictures and maps. And uh, we were able to, to go to, you know, in different places in, in the same basic recession. Uh, financially, we would like to thank IUCN uh, US and the Alcoa Foundation, Boscalis and Espresso also for their generous funding. And I also want to um, thank two colleagues, Prue Addison and Nadine McCormick, that were very much part of the original design of this idea I mean, a few years ago. Um, both of them went different paths, but they have been really, you know, was uh, was really the interesting conversations in front of a glass of wine that uh, led us to where we stand today. Now, where are we going? What's next? We have um, a commitment to translate the document in Chinese. This will be ready by the end of the month. And uh, I think we plan to do a dissemination with an event in China in May. I'm still, I still have to formalize this discussion with my colleagues in IUC in China. And that's a plan. And again, we will make sure that this is uh, publicized so that you can, you, can, um, you can advertise also throughout your network. We are planning a, a promotion um, uh, phase where we really want to make sure that these guidelines are used as much as possible. So we want to make sure that we also, there is a very strong alignment with the SBT and the science-based targets, you know, work that is being done through the network and others. Katie already mentioned you know, the, the guidance, but there is especially the methodologies that are important. I think the idea is that we would like to have as many companies as possible ready by when the methodology are formally launched in 2022. So this is a conversation that IUCN, but other organizations are having as part of the, you know, as participants of the SBT network to make sure that we are all working with the same kind of approach where basically we get to the same place in 2022 with all the companies we work with to make sure that everybody is ready to start using the methodology for the science-based targets. So um, on that, I think we have uh, two more minutes. So I give you back two minutes. I don't want to, um, actually, I just want to repeat again, sorry. The biobizaucn.org uh, is the email you can use if you have any questions and additional questions or question that was not answered. Um, and also don't forget that the, the We Value Nature program is not finished, it's going on until the 24th of March. There's a lot of interesting events coming up in the next few days. You can go on their website, check out and register directly from the website. And also you can be part of the, the conversation in the Capitals community. Here is also the link. You can register there and continue a conversation with like-minded um, colleagues about natural capital and generally biodiversity in business. 
So uh, that's all from our side. I think I just like to thank you so much for participating and staying until this hour. It has been a very rich conversation. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of slides, but hopefully useful. Um, we will send uh, an email later tonight or tomorrow with a lot of all the links and um, and then in the future also we will keep make sure that we keep you up to date on where we are planning to do as a next phase in implementing the guidelines in an IUCN kind of approach. So thank you all again, thank you to the fantastic speakers, thank you to Gillian for being behind the, behind the screen this time and helping us making sure that this event has been smoothly implemented and um, have a good evening. Bye-bye.